totally different this morning. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for having showed up already. We had a, we had a suddenly. We had a little suddenly here a while ago. Thank you, Father, for showing up. Father, I ask you to open the eyes of our inner man and the hearing of our inner man to see and hear with our inner man and let the seeing and the hearing fuse together, merge together in our hearts and in our spirits, Father, in an explosion of revelation of who you are. And then show us how to live out of it. In Jesus' name, amen. There's nothing more to pray other than that. I got <laughs> this. You, you never heard nothing like this come out of my mouth. But this is, it fits in with what I've say, been saying about the Abrahamic covenant and all of that, but this is totally different. The message this morning is entitled From Glory to Glory. Glory to Glory. G O R E Y, glory to glory. Go to Exodus chapter 24. No. Yeah. Chapter 24. We'll start in verse 3. Just get a little scriptural foundation here. <clears throat> on page 93. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which was spoken we will do, which the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel, and he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it on the basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all, those, all these words. Then Moses went up, I'm going down to 11, with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet, see, they're having a vision, they were caught up with God. There appeared to be a pavement of sapphires, clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate, and they drank of the supper that he prepared for them. Uh, and it was in the presence of their enemies. Amen. Now go to Leviticus chapter 1. You've got to understand all of this in its context. We're just going to look at, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to peruse through chapter 1 here very quickly. The burnt offering. Verse 1. Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him at the, from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd of the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it a male without defect. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. And he, he shall slay the young bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall offer up the blood and sprinkle the blood on the altar that is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire, and then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, the head, and the suet over the wood which is on the fire that is on the altar. And its entrails, however, and its legs he shall wash with water. And the priest shall offer up smoke, all, in smoke, all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, and an offering by fire of soothing aroma to the Lord. 
But if his offering is from the flock of the sheep or, or, or of the goats for a burnt offering, he shall offer it yet a male without defect. And he shall slay it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord and Aaron's sons, and the priest shall sprinkle its blood on the altar. And he shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its hood, and the priest shall arrange them on the wood which is on the fire that is on the altar. The entrails, however, and the legs he shall wash with water. Oh, my God, do you see what I'm about to say? And the priest shall offer all of it and offer it up and smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering for a fi by fire for a soothing aroma to the Lord. But if his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, then he shall bring his offering from the turtle doves or from young pigeons. And the priest shall bring it on the, uh, to the altar and wring its head and offer it up in smoke on the altar, and its blood is to be drained on the side of the altar. He shall also take away its crop with its feathers and cast it beside the altar eastward to the place of the ashes. And then he shall tear it by its wings, and he shall not sever it, but the priest shall offer it up in smoke on the altar or the wood which is on the fire as a burnt offering, an offering uh, by fire, a soothing aroma to the Lord. Worship back in those days was a bloody business. But there was a method a reasoning that God did things the way he did them as a shadow type of things to come. Please hear me this morning. Abraham, back in Genesis 12. Go there. I want to show you this. Now, this was the initiation of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, we've gone through this before, but I want you to see something. Verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Leave the old ways behind. You're about to go into a new, form, a new style of life that I'm going to show you. Yeah, you're beginning to see, aren't you? Leave the old things behind and go into a place you've never gone before. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will, I will show you my manifested presence and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, shall come to know my presence in their lives. See, this is what you have to read into the Abrahamic covenant in terms of what we're in today. Verse 4, So Abram went forth from the Lord, or as the Lord had spoken to him, and lot with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. He departed everything, all his friends, he took a few kinfolk with him. All the territory that was familiar. Left his backyard. Left his backyard, and in a sense, he left a style of life behind him. Because new territory demands a new style of life in order to exist there. So Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they accumulated and the persons which they acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. All they took was their own personal stuff. Their friends, the familiar things, the familiar lay of the land, the familiar sights and sounds and smells. All left behind. And Abram passed through the land as far as the side of Shechem to the, to the oak of Moreh. And now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I'll give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. He built an altar. 
Verse 8, Then he proceeded from there to the mountain to the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai, Ai on the east, and there he built another altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, he was an altar-building rascal. Abraham built altars. Worship. Covenant. Presence. Blessing. Remembrance of the things that God had done and is doing for them, for him now. Right then. In that time, in that place. Now we go over to chapter 15. <sighs> Verse 1, and after these things, the word of the Lord came to him. Now, this is after his meeting with Melchizedek, okay, in verse uh, chapter 14. Abraham had to fight a fight. Somebody had captured his kinfolk and his, some of his people and all of that, and he had to get up an army of 300 and go get them. After these things, in verse 1, for chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you, and your reward will be very great. Now this is after the initial speaking of the covenant that God made to him, not with the writing down of, of words by rules and regulations and law. It was by a verbal pledge. You have to understand that. This is before the law was given. Uh, and then Abram said, O oh Lord God, what wilt thou give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since thou hast given no offspring to me, one born in my house, no, uh, one born in my house is my heir. See, there was no firstborn to leave anything to. He couldn't see how it's going to happen. Then in the fourth verse here, he said a, an amazing thing. Now, get hold of this. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Huh? Then he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he brought him, said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord God, how may I know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all these things to him and cut them in two and laid each half on opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. Look at verse 11. And the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram had to drive them away. He had to stand there over his sacrifice and drive the birds of prey off of it to keep the birds of prey for con from consuming the ratification of what God had showed him. God has showed each of us a lot of things for our lives, but we have not stood over and, been, and, and stood guard over the things that God has put in our heart and we've allowed the enemy to steal from us. And today is the day you have to take a stand and say no more and drive the birds of prey off. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, for they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. God was showing him things ahead, way ahead. He was showing him things that were going to happen in the time of Moses. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. Yeah. 
and afterward they will come out with many possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried. At a good old age, and then in the fourth generation they shall return there, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now look at verse 17. And it came about when the sun had set, and it was very dark. And behold, there, was a, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. And on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Ken, Kenizzite and the Kadamite. And all these other rites. What does a smoking oven represent? Now, first of all, you have to understand. You've heard me say this before, but I've got to say it again. The way a covenant was ratified in those days was with blood. Abram had prepared the sacrifice, laid, built this altar and as a place of worship. And it's history. Interesting that, that Abram built the altar, but God showed up there because it was for him. It was to honor the Lord God. And he put the sacrifice, I don't know how big it was, but there was a half the sacrifice over here, half the sacrifice over here. And it was a bloody bit. I mean, there's blood running everywhere. And Abram walked between them. When he did that, he said, God, I accept what you told me. I believe it. And so shall it is, as you have said it, so shall it be. And then God showed up as a smoking oven and a flaming torch. Now, in the Old Testament, a flaming torch, or a great fire of anything, remember the fire that led them by night coming out of Egypt, was God. It was a symbol for the presence of God. The burning bush, the whole business. But what was a smoking oven? Huh? What was the smoking oven? Yes. How do you bake bread? How do you cook your meat? You cook it on the stove in the oven. Bread was baked in an oven. It stood for provision. When Jesus told the disciples, when they asked him, how should we pray? Give us this day our what? Daily bread. Provision is still there. Provision is always in a covenant with God. It's already done. It's already being cooked for you. It's being prepared. And then in Exodus 23, 18, it talks about the sacrifice of blood and unleavened bread. Now we've already talked about the blood, but what does the unleavened bread stand for? Purity. 23.18. In other words, there's nothing in the sacrifice that's going to show up to screw it up, to mess everything up. Now, there's a time you live in the bread with yeast and stuff like that, but there's a time that you, they, uh, in the Passover, it was unleavened bread. Why? Exactly. It was to remind them of the purity of their relationship between them and the Lord God. And then we come down to today. Starting at 2,000 years ago, Jesus said this amazing thing in Matthew 4, 17. You ought to know it by heart by now. Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is where? Right here, right now, and you need to change how you think, or you'll never see it. Hebrews 11, verse 24 through 28, especially in 28, talks about Moses keeping the Passover. And then in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul talks about Jesus Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. Second Corinthians chapter seven. You ought to see this.
verse 9 and 10. I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God in order that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. You were made sorrowful according to the will of God that you might not suffer loss. Now you've got to get this. The next verse. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world is simply saying, okay, God, I'm sorry, you won't catch me next time. I'll be smarter about it. <laughs> but you won't be because there's nothing hidden from him with whom we have to do, says the writer of Hebrews. You think you can get away with it? I got news for you. Somebody saw you. Somebody heard you. Somebody heard Miriam when she whispered against Moses. She thought nobody heard her talk and Aaron talking, but it says, and, but God heard it. She spent a week outside the camp with leprosy because of it. She suffered a loss. Back to Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation on repentance from dead works and of faith to God, toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we shall do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Jesus is not going to crawl up there on the cross again for you or anybody else. He's done it once and we have to understand this. Christians don't understand this, that what he did at Calvary was enough. It was so enormous and so huge, and the defeat of the devil was so complete. The defeat of the powers of darkness was so complete that he didn't need to do anything else. All that's left for us to do is repent and live by it. True repentance, because if you don't truly repent according to the will of God, you're not going to live by it. It's not going to be in your life, because God knows your heart. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Just like in the Passover, they put the blood over the door jam up there, the lintel, and down the side post, but you notice they never put it down there where you had to walk on it. You don't walk on the blood. You don't put the blood under your feet. Walking over a ground is a symbol of, is also a, a, a biblical symbol of something that, that you own, that you control. You don't control God. You don't own God. But you get to have His presence in your life. Walking on the blood and, 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 and disrespecting the blood to me is the same as the blasphemy of the Holy, of the Holy Ghost. You disrespect the blood of Christ, you reject the blood of Christ, and therefore you reject God, what God did, you reject the Christ, and that's the one thing that will send you to hell and gone. That's what I just said. It's a mockery of God, and God says, do not be uh, deceived. God is not mocked. In Galatians. You think you're getting away with it? I got news for you, you're not. Hebrews 9.22 says there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. The blood that Jesus shed has provided enough forgiveness for the rest of the human race for all time, up until the second coming. It was enough. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. That's what I just said.
What does repentance involve? Changing how we think. How, what changes how we think? Getting our minds renewed. To leave the old thing behind and walk into something new that God has for us. To walk into new ground, to walk into a new place in God. Leave the nasty words behind. Leave your drinking behind. Leave your, leave your lusts behind. Leave your idolatries behind. Walk into something new. Walk into something new that's clean and pure and pristine in God. God's not a dull God, folks. He's a fun-loving fe fella. He's an exciting fella. You, you, go walk, you walk with God... I guarantee you, you're going to have excitement in your life. You'll have all the excitement you can handle and then some. You will have experiences you never dreamed of. Having said all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of overviewing some things this morning. We all know what victory in life is like. We all know what it feels like for the roof to fall in on you after you've had a victory. Did you know that that is not how things are supposed to be? The birds of prey come at the time of victory and will do everything in their power to steal that victory from you and make you think it never happened. It will steal your healing. It will steal your finances. It will steal everything you've got. It will steal restored relationships it, with your wife, your husband, your children. It will steal your, the, the promotion that you got. It will steal any and everything good that's ever happened to you if you let them. You have to stand over what you have received by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you have to fight the fight of faith to keep that victory. You can't afford to be slack and lacked. You can't afford to sit on your butt and have your laurels, excuse me, <laughs> and watch the rest of the world go by, and all of a sudden you see another people being successful, and all of a sudden you find yourself back in that same damnable deep hole you just crawled out of. You never stop fighting. You're born into this world. You're born into a war. And when you leave it, you're, you're going to be in this war till you leave this world. So after victory, then what? How, who, who sings that song, uh, then what? <laughs> that old country song said, then what? <laughs> Ephesians 6, 13 and 14. We'll start there. Oh, this is not. <laughs> Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. The first thing people do after a victory is fall away. They don't stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, because of all the above, having girded your loins with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one, evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With in view, be on the alert with perseverance and petition for all the saints. If in other words, you're going to pray for the saints, pray in the Holy Ghost. The only offensive piece of weaponry listed there is the sword of the Spirit. The rest of it is defensive armor. But it'll work if you employ it, like he said. But you've got to stand in it. If you stand there naked before the devil, he'll tromp all over you. If you have on the armor of God, he can't bust through it. And he gets up there in your face and wants to get close enough, then you stick the sword of the Spirit in him. In him. Don't wave it in God's face. 
It wasn't made for that. It was made to stick in the enemy. You have to die daily to self. You have to take up. That's what Jesus said. You, anybody who wants to follow me, let him take up his cross and follow me. But if your old man's dead, dead gummit, let him stay dead. Amen. Quit trying to go back and live the old life you used to live. You can't do it. Quit trying to bury the dead horse and let him go. When you go before the Lord, stay gory. You go before the altar. You go to the altar and go before God. You turn yourself inside out. Here's all the yucky stuff that's in me. When they washed the entrails that weren't burned, what does that mean? How does that correspond? By the washing of the water of the Word. What does the, what does the, what does the smoke and the fire mean? It means let God burn up all that mess up that you turn your inside out on the altar and let Him burn it up forever. Be done with it. That's a soothing aroma to him. Stay repentant. Stay in the glory. Stand firm. Be devil resistant. You've heard of water resistant this and water resistant clothes, fire resistant clothing and stuff like that. Stay devil resistant. The Bible says resist the enemy and he'll do what? He'll run off. Stay in your robes of righteousness and move immediately. Now listen to me. This is the mo I'm closing with this, but this is the most important part. Move immediately to your next victory because your next fight is the door to your next walk in the glory of God. People look at the fight and say, I don't want to, do I don't want to go there. I don't feel like doing it anymore. Yeah? <laughs> you look at your fight as the next door open into a greater walk with the Lord if you approach it that way you won't stand still where you are now you'll keep going look at your next fight as a door open your next vi as a victory and it's another glory Walk in the glory of God. It's, 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 just a, it's just another opportunity to defeat the devil. Yeah. You don't have to hunt them. They'll come to you. But you have to get rid of the nasty on the inside of you. You have to get rid of the gory on the inside of you and repent. And do it every day. Every single day. <laughs> However often it needs to be done. And you know. You wonder why. People wonder why blessings don't show up regularly in their lives. Oh, God, it's been a while. Where have you been? And he says, where have you been? Where have you been? That's when you know it's time to hit your knees or fall prostrate on your face and worship Him and say, here I am. I'm open. Clean me out. Clean me out. This is the key to not only receiving healing and prosperity and the blessings of God, but staying in them. Staying in them. Staying in them. From victory to victory. From overcoming situation to overcoming situation. And doing what it takes in God to achieve that victory. To come out on top of that situation. Because we've accepted the sacrifice of the blood of, of the Lamb. The Passover Christ. With our sacrifice. 
We don't have to go cut a bull up or a goat or a sheep or, or birds or anything like that. His blood was, what he did at the cross was enough. And if we embrace Christ as Lord, as Lord, King of kings and Savior of the world and my personal Savior and Redeemer, then that blood covers us. That blood makes us righteous. And when we go before God and say, God, I repent, then that blood washes all of it away and it's like it never happened. Because it's already there. Jesus is in you. And you're in Him. You're bathed in that blood. It made your inner man new. The old man's dead. Don't try to, don't try to be that old man again. Don't go there anymore. Leave that land of the old man behind. Leave that form of life behind you. You'll walk in the newness of life in God in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you this morning for this. I'm going to open it up here at the front. If you want to, if you want to start your repentance right now, come on up. Will you?